Welcome to Product AMA, your daily online Ask Me Anything. We started Product AMA to give those passionate or curious about product management a daily break, something to look forward to. Our topic for today is innovation in banking. And to tell us all about it, we have Mukesh Jha, who is a product lead at the Scotia Bank Digital Factory. Prior to joining Digital Factory, Mukesh has led growth at OpenCare and Staffy and has also worked as an entrepreneur in residence, a title which he still holds at, uh, holds at the Digital Factory. Outside of work, Mukesh is also an amazing table tennis player. We are so excited to have you, Mukesh, on Product AMA. Why don't you introduce yourself to our audience and tell us about your entrepreneurial role at the Digital Factory. Thank you. Thanks, Rhythm. That's very kind. Thanks to all three of you for having me here today. Uh, it's, it's so amazing uh, to, be, uh, to be speaking to everyone here. Uh, uh, I've been following your videos uh, on Product AMA and it's so amazing. So much, so much to learn. Um, a little bit of background on me is I'm an engineer by education. I did seven years of uh, technology consulting in Asia Pacific, mainly in Australia and Singapore. I then decided to sort of uh, part ways with corporate career and build my own companies. I spent the next five and a half years uh, with, with a college friend of mine to build two companies. Um, I got major failure and minor success, but lots to learn. And then I decided to sort of uh, continue working with startups, but those startups that had a little bit more money uh, so that, you know, I could just focus on building product, growing them. So I, I, I spent, I think, about two and a half years or so in India with one, co one company called Little Internet. They had raised $50 million. So I was their head of uh, growth and, and, and marketing as well. Um, and uh, then I was managing the PNL for another cloud telephony company that was trying to scale in Southeast Asia and North Africa. Uh, so I was uh, managing their international PNLs. Um, and then I decided that it's time to sort of try and build global companies. So let's move to North America. So then I had the option of going to the US as an exceptional entrepreneur. And then we had Trump. So I chose Canada. <laughs> Canada is so good, uh, very welcoming to immigrants. So I came to Canada. Uh, the first year in Canada was very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, you have to have a Canadian experience. So I had to go through a little bit of struggle over there. But I, I, I think now when I look back in retrospect, there's just so much to learn to understand uh, the culture, how people think about work and stuff. There was just so much to learn. So I, I was very lucky to actually be part of Tribal Scale Venture Studios where I was an EIR. I was helping them build a product which, uh, you know, which sort of connects people uh, for meaningful conversations spent. I was part of uh, their cohort, one of their cohorts. And then I was mentoring a bunch of other companies as well through which Staffy reached out to me and wanted me to help them on growth. Uh, and then OpenCare uh, was doing a lot of online acquisition really, really well. And they, were, they wanted to sort of try offline acquisition strategy and I had done a lot of that as well uh, in the past. So I spent some time with them. Uh, interestingly, Scotiabank, uh, uh, I was chatting with a few folks at Scotiabank and uh, you know, th there were three or four different roles for which uh, I was being considered, but eventually I ended up taking uh, the product lead role for the messaging cluster. A little bit of work, a little bit of detail on what I do at Scotiabank. So I own the messaging cluster uh, and through my messaging cluster, I serve the messages on different touch points, uh, different customer touch points. And the intents that my cluster serves is basically sales, engagement, notification, product onboarding, customer onboarding, outage, regulatory, all of those. The biggest, the heaviest intent for us is sales. And through my cluster, uh, we drive digital sales, which is about 60% of uh, total revenue in Canada. So your last question, why am I called, how, how do I maintain the entrepreneur in residence uh, status at DF? So DF is a very interesting setup. Uh, it actually started, I think started three, three years or so back when, uh, when Scotia felt that the touch points that we had for the customers really needed that focus, that customer focus so that we can provide the experience to our customers, which they get outside of our app on other social app, other e-commerce, you know, food delivery, all, all the other apps is the same set of customers that are using my banking app as well. How do we take our touch points to a better level? But I think in, right in the beginning, some folks were actually trying that shiny thing. They were chasing those kind of opportunities and uh, those initiatives sort of met with the success of, of failure that most such initiatives 
meet like less than 10% or even lesser. Uh, and I think somewhere uh, the first one and a half to two years is when the recalibration happened. And, and the focus was, hey, look, we have tens of millions of customers in Canada. Why am I chasing an idea which can scale to just 100,000 customers? What happens to a lot of my customers who really deserve the experience that uh, they're getting elsewhere and they're expecting from the app? And that's when we changed our focus back. Um, and uh, that's where DF, I think, started sort of inviting a lot of entrepreneurs as well. I was lucky to be considered as well. And given this messaging cluster where, uh, you know, I have full flexibility in deciding what I want to do. It's just that I have to ensure that I get alignment with my director and VP. And they're super supportive as well because some of them have, uh, actually most of them have had good good number of years uh, working with startups in their background. And that sort of really helps a lot. Awesome. That's great. And like, I was fortunate enough to get a glimpse of the digital factory a couple of months back. And trust me, like it looks like a startup. And that's why like, I was shocked to see how a bank is operating like a startup. So that was great to see. All right, let's get, let's get started with the AMA. And uh, just before that, uh, to those of you who are just joining us, we are talking with Mukesh Jha, who is the product lead at uh, the Scotia Bank Digital Factory. Feel free to ask your questions because it's an AMA, ask me anything. So feel free to ask your questions in the Zoom chat and I'll pick them up very soon. All right, question number one. Uh, we, we want to get to know more about uh, what has been happening in banking over the last few years. How has the landscape changed and what are the banks, uh, what, what are the things that banks are focusing on in terms of innovation? Sure, that, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for the question. So I think I want to answer it in, uh, in different parts. So if I look at a lot of the challenger banks, they're sort of looking at a niche customer segment um, and around an entry into the, into the big sector is how they are looking at it in, in terms of how they can provide that amazing, amazing experience to the customers and acquire these customers. I think the hope over there is that these customers will stay with those challenger banks for life and not just for, for that one niche product, but for all other products as well. I think that's how some of the banks have approached it. I think uh, in Europe that has done really well. Uh, I think it's also, it's getting better in Canada and the US as well. Um, so, so that's one thing that I see with challenger banks. The only thing that I struggle with is that it's, 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 uh, it has its own, it, there's a challenge. There is a, uh, you know, it takes so much effort to sort of acquire customers and build a product that they absolutely love but you can't just offer one product to a customer and expect them to stay with you for life. You have to be able to offer a variety of products because when you look at a banking sector, we have customers who've stayed with us for a few decades, right? Not just one year or two year. And as customer, you know, moves from, you know, one, like they're 25 and 35, 45, 55, the whole need changes, uh, not just their need, but the whole family need. And, uh, you know, uh, the product that the banks, the challenger banks are offering will have to evolve from what they're offering today to what all they should offer. Because otherwise, if they don't do that, that same customer is going to come to one of the large banks like Scotia and other banks. And that's where, you know, if our products are also not so bad or, or good enough, we will end up acquiring that customer away from the challenger bank. And we've seen that happen already uh, with Scotia Bank. Uh, so that's one thing that I've seen. At large banks, I've seen some of the banks, they just came up with the labs, digital labs and digital factories. Some of them said, hey, look, banking, we are very strong. Why don't I try something else? Because my customers are not just doing banking, they're doing other stuff as well. If I can build other successful touch points, I'll be able to sort of engage the same set of customers better, increase the lifetime value and stuff like that. So some of them have tried with you know, major minor success kind of a thing. Uh, I haven't seen any outlier yet. Uh, which is both good and bad, because why has that not happened yet? And good is there is an opportunity for one of these, uh, you know, large banks to actually go ahead and do that. Uh, but I've seen more often in at least the large banks that they realize that their touch points that they were offering to their customers and the experience that they were offering to the customers uh, definitely needed to be, you know, way better than what it used to be. And that's where I think a lot of focus has gone, at least at Scotia, for sure. And we've definitely delivered on that. But more than just improving what we used to offer to our customers, I look at it more uh, in terms of we wanted to do all these fancy things, right? We tried something, we struggled, then we recalibrated, and now we, we're sort of improving our touch points. But while we're doing that, 
we gain this momentum. We are in a zone where we are able to think of something and actually go ahead and implement. And my customers are loving it. Our, our app today is one of the best banking apps in Canada. Our ratings are only getting better, right? So we are in a zone where our, you know, the success rate is way higher. Our confidence is fairly high. Our bank really firmly, very firmly believes in the whole philosophy of DF. Uh, in fact, our bank wants to double down and wants us to double in size. We're already 500 plus. Uh, we are struggling in finding the right talent to, to grow at that scale. So that's where we are, at least at large banks. However, just improving my customer touch points is not good enough. So a few of us uh, at DF, at least, are working on other initiatives as well, which are a little bit of a swing. We are taking a swing. It is outside of just what we offer to my customers today. It's actually trying to create the ecosystem. And I'm more talking in terms of, you know, the payment space or the digital identity space. I think we're doing a lot of stuff already. A lot of work has gone in, but I think, uh, you know, over time we will see those uh, products become really establish us in, in a position of strength. And from there, you know, we will be able to sort of use the same products on my existing customers and provide them even more value than what we do today. Uh, but that's on the large banks. But, but the one, uh, you know, kind of companies that I really sort of look out for uh, is, is the Amazon and Google's of the world. Because if, you know, they are already moving towards that banking and the way they think about product is, is supreme, is amazing. And if I would really get scared, watch out for, I really watch out for those companies. I'm not so worried about the challenger banks. We have, you know, Tangerine with us. So we own that bank, right? Uh, so, so Challenger Bank is fine. We are doing really amazing. We're doing a lot of ecosystem play, but I'm really uh, sort of look out for the technology companies who are trying to become banks. Awesome. And we already have like three questions, four questions flowing in from the audience. I'm going to go ahead and ask one of them. Uh, sure. We have a question from Lee, uh, who's asking, how is your team in messaging structured? How's my team in messaging structure? Interesting. So we are actually part of a capability team. So we actually have some touch point teams. So I have a, you know, app team. I have a web team. Uh, I have, a, you know, an ABM team. And so those teams essentially connect to my team. Uh, my team is actually called Pigeon. Uh, it's like the pigeon that carries messages. So I'm part of that messaging cluster. They all connect to us and through APIs, we are able to figure out the context of the user. We try and understand the context of the user the background of the customer, and uh, we try and deliver the right message at the right time to the right customer in the right format, uh, and, and sort of get, get, get the right interactions from the customer to learn and improve the messages delivered to them next time. And we try and do that across all other systems. So, uh, you know, a customer that sees uh, a message on, on, the Nova, uh, on my mobile app actually goes and interacts with an ABM machine to draw cash. Can I learn from that interaction, the mobile app to enhance the experience that uh, my customer is getting when they're drawing money from the ABM machine. So I do that without actually facing the customer. I'm, I'm trying to be the brain on every message that a customer sees on the app. All right. Uh, another question, this is more, uh, you know, related to your previous experience. So Harman is asking that you previously ran a startup in the automotive space for, sure. for quite a few years before moving to Canada. What skills in your experience would you say have proven to be transferable in your current role as a product lead at DF? That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that's common between my, my venture and at, at DF is, you know, we are in the B2C space. So it's, it's a customer that I'm trying to serve. Um, and in fact, I, I don't call myself a product person, a great product person. I'm more an entrepreneur. I'm a problem solver. I just happen to be doing product right now. Uh, but the way I approach any problem is actually try and understand the customer, trying to understand what does the customer need, want, and deserve uh, at a given point in time and uh, around the context that the customer is, is accessing a particular product. I, so I have done the same thing when I was trying to run my own venture. And my venture, maybe I'll quickly talk about my venture. My venture was basically Uber on auto rickshaws. But I thought about that before Uber started, right? Just to take some credit. And uh, Auto Rickshaw is a three-wheeler that runs in India. There are, I think, about three million of those in India. Uh, millions of rides happen every single day. I had a few thousand on my platform. And I would always think about what does my customer really want? And back in India, I used to think about, hey, there are pregnant ladies who actually work. And the public commute is not so good that they can just sort of access it. It's not very comfortable for pregnant ladies. What, how can I solve their problem? There are elderly people who need to go to hospitals. How do I solve their problem? Uh, there are people who don't really have a mobile phone. Can I solve their problem? 
There are people who have mobile phone, but don't, they don't have enough balance on the mobile phone uh, to even have, or they don't have data. How can they access my app or how can they access my inventory that I'm, that I'm offering to them? So I used to think all the scenarios and think about the product from that perspective. When I'm in Canada now at Scotiabank, it's the same thought process that I'm translating saying, hey, when a customer comes to my app, what is my customer really thinking? Like if the customer has, doesn't even have a credit card, why are they coming five times? What are they checking? If they're not spending money, what, why do they engage with my app? And why do they again come onto the desktop? Or if I send them an email, you know, are they accessing my mobile app or are they accessing my desktop? And is, is there something for me to learn? So it's basically just understanding, trying to be in the minds of the customer to understand the context and the experience uh, and what is it that they need, want, and deserve? Just think along those lines and try to think, am I providing all of that to not? all of that to my customers or not, and also try and understand how whatever I provide to my customer delivers value to my business as well. All right. And you spoke a little bit earlier, you spoke about skills. And I think the last question was also around skills. And um, if I understand correctly, you also come from a non-banking background. And I'm sure there are so many PMs out there who are looking to follow a similar career path uh, pivoting into, pivoting into uh, banking from a different industry. So what do you think are the skills that PMs should focus on and how do you suggest they make such a transition? That's an interesting question. That's a very good question. So I think I'm just going to give a theoretical answer, which everyone knows. It's basically if, if a PM can do one job, what is it that they should do is to just be the voice of the customer in the room where product decisions are being made, right? Is to represent the customer and to ensure that whatever gets built is going to add value to the customer. It is how I think about you know, the role of a PM. Um, now coming back to your question, like many people are trying to move into product management roles and how should they think about it? Maybe I'll talk about how do I think about it. So when I found out that I'm going to be part of the messaging cluster uh, at Scotiabank, um, you know, I started thinking, you know, what is a message essentially, right? So, you know, if you're on a social app, uh, what, is a, what is the meaning of a message? Like, what kind of message really makes sense? Or whenever you're logging to the app, what kind of message actually appeals to you, brings a smile to your face? Or you are not expecting, but you see that and suddenly like, you feel that the app knows you. I hope in a good way, right? Some people actually panic as well. You're talking with your wife about a product and you open you know, Google and it shows you out about that same product. It's sort of you panic and like saying someone is hearing your stuff. Uh, but, uh, but, but I try and understand if someone is on a social app, uh, what kind of messages make sense to them? If someone is on, a, is on an e-commerce app, what kind of messages make sense to them? Like on, on Amazon, you go and they say, hey, you search for this product here or other products that you should consider or whatever, right? Things like that. What kind of uh, expectation I have on a dating app? What kind, of, uh, what kind of messages am I expecting if I'm on a food delivery app, right? So, so at least for me, instead of trying to understand banking, and, and I, it's something that I can't say I'm an expert of right now. I'm, I'm continuing to learn banking. There's just so much to learn in banking, but I'm part of the messaging cluster. So I try and understand the message and I try and understand the customer and the context. Uh, because if I can really understand my customer and the context and the demographic and the expectation, that sort of suddenly puts me in a position to understand, you know, what are the right messages that I can deliver to my customer. Uh, and that's how I have navigated my transition to product right now. Any suggestion to people who are thinking of that, I would say is, is to just, you know, be the, be the customer of the product you're trying to build and uh, try and sit as close to the customer as possible so that you can really relate to the customer. Uh, you know, uh, try and understand every, like there are so many products out there in the market these days. You can open, you know, the top 10 and try and question every single thing, the font, the color, the layout, the design, the response, whatever. And one can learn so many things so quickly in terms of why it is done the way it is done. Uh, and that sort of puts you in a position where you can really be an effective PM. I'm sort of not answering how do you get that PM job. I'm saying once you get the job, how do you how can you do the job better? Yep. And another question around skills. So I think through my various con uh, conversations from uh, with, with product people in the banking industry, I've learned that the top skill required is stakeholder management. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you manage stakeholders? Do you have any interesting instances to share with the audience here? 
Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's a great question, especially in the context of large banks trying to run, uh, you know, trying to run digital labs. Uh, so I think at least Scotia DF is, is structured really, really well. Uh, I'm very proud of my leaders at Scotia because they really shield us from a lot of stakeholder management, if you will, uh, with the business lines. Instead, they are doing it for us. And they're essentially creating an opportunity for us as in the, the, the product managers, senior product managers, product leads to focus on the execution, right? So they are sort of really giving us very clear mandates in terms of what we need to do to achieve the business goal, the goal of DF, you know, and deliver value for the customer and allowing us, uh, you know, you know, the full, you know, giving us the whole opportunity to just go ahead and execute really well. A lot of the stakeholder management is actually being done by them with the business line. We are being pulled in every now and then, but it's, it's more often that they are able to shield us away from all of that that happens in a large company so that we can focus on execution. And that is something that I really like at Scotia. Uh, interesting instance. So DF has been able to deliver such good value to the bank that uh, it has actually flipped over. And now a lot of business lines are coming to DF saying, hey, we want you to do this. Can you do this for us, please? And instead, they are now sitting in, in, in the leadership at DF and presenting their case saying, hey, can you guys take an hour work? So, so that's an interesting, so the stakeholder management has actually gone the other way, where we are sitting there, you know, have shown decent success that the business lines are sort of queuing up and saying, please do this for us because I think we need this. And it has taken its own, uh, you know, time and effort as well. But uh, it's great to be in a position, uh, you know, where we don't have to actively, my leaders are managing it for us and we are given the territory to go ahead and play. Great. Uh, we have a question here from Victor, who's asking that, what tools or frameworks are you using to generate new ideas, develop new products, uh, and ensure uh, customer success? Could you please provide examples? That's a great question. What tools? Um, so the regular answer is, you know, we, we do a lot of messages and we are able to see the CTRs, like how many people are looking at the preview, how many, what are the impressions, what are the deliveries, impressions, CTRs, and whether people are following through all the way or not. Uh, obviously, those things are there as well. But we, we do have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, design research people in the, in the company, and we are constantly doing a lot of research with our customers to understand, you know, what kind of messages make sense to them, right? Uh, an example, I'm just trying to think of an example that we've done. Um, an example of that has come out from, so, so we, we used to get a lot of, yeah, uh, one example. So we have a top spot on the app where we, uh, which we sort of hold only for very special communication. And we try and never use that for sales because we don't want to up your sales seat to my customers. We are, our intent is message. If we deliver the right job, the customers will buy from us, right? Because our products are great. Uh, you know, everything, if, if we do the right things with our customers, the customers will trust us and will stay with us, will buy from us. And, and so when win for both of us, right? So we sort of hold that position uh, n n for everything but sales, but we do a lot of GIC uh, messages to our customers. And uh, if you are not reaching out to our customers to sort of renew their GIC, they are losing out, right? So when we did a lot of research, the customers were absolutely love if you reached out to them and we, sh we were in their face saying, hey, please renew your GIC, otherwise you lose it, right? That sort of changed the way we think about sales, right? It's the same thing for payments. Some people forget paying their credit card bill. Now that's gonna, like they have to, ch they'll be charged, their credit card score could be impacted and stuff like that. That has happened to so many people, right? And if I'm in their face reminding them multiple times saying, hey, please pay your bill or please pay your mortgage, right? You know, the customer, if you ask customer in normal context, they would be like, I don't really need to be told, I'll do it, whatever I have scheduled it. But for some customers, this was a feedback that came from the research that we did. They were like, oh, such scenarios, we would love for you to actually tell me every time I'm opening the web or app or email, if you're telling me about it, that's great. So we changed our direction based on the feedback that we got from the customers. Awesome. And uh, we have another question here from Kwan, uh, who's talking about, who's asking that, in large banks, many uh, you know, chief executives jumps, uh, jump from banks to banks uh, every few years. Most revenue center heads don't want to burn their PNL for fintech experiments. 
Can you share how is digital factory structured to navigate the banking legacy? Interesting, interesting question. <laughs> I see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, I can relate to a lot of stuff that has been discussed. And uh, I wouldn't say that that was never the case at Scotia. I think uh, Scotia DF went through its own, you know, uh, struggle of getting over that kind of a framework to a point where we sort of committed to deliver value for my customers while delivering value for the bank as well, right? And uh, that shows in the reviews that we get for the app. That shows in the business that business that we are driving through my app and web for the bank, right? So in the beginning, it was like the business lines, you know, wouldn't want to spend money on experimentation. That's that's so true. But given the kind of success we've shown, they're only sort of you know giving us more budget to try you know and and do more experimentation than what we can actually do. We are struggling more. Uh, you know, in being able to source the right talent so that we can do enough experiments instead the other way saying, oh, we would like to do experiments, please give us budget. That's not how it is. Having said that, you know, banks and, you know, Canadian banks being a little conservative and, you know, in the COVID times, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time before we are given the green lights, but we are told way in advance that, you know, the approval is coming, the approval is there, but there'll be a date by when we can actually start execution. So, uh, you know, it has taken three odd years, but we are at a point where we've shown value to, to the business lines, to the customers, and which has allowed us to be in a position where we get, uh, we get a lot of support from our business lines, from my DF leaders to actually go and do a lot of experimentation. We are doing a lot of experimentation, but bulk of what we do is actually ensuring that the value is immediate and we can see it, we can measure it, we can see it, we get the feedback, and a lot of stuff is in the works. And I think a lot, you know, some of that will start showing in, in 2021. Uh, yeah, early 2021. All right. And uh, great questions, everyone. Keep them coming. Um, we are at the halfway mark, almost at the halfway mark here. And uh, keep your questions coming. Feel free to ask any questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, you talked, you touched upon a little bit about experimentation. And my next question is uh, that banks are typically seen as slow moving and uh, conservative institutions right. where change is hard to promote. Uh, on the other hand, entrepreneurship is a lot more dynamic, fast paced. Uh, you know, you're trying to get the ideas out to the users uh, and get validation and feedback from them. So right. how do you, uh, you know, in your entrepreneurial role at, at DF, weave these two together? That's an interesting question. Thank you for the question. So I think, you know, the whole fast moving hustle and all of that, for some reason, people in startup relate that to succeed, success, but that doesn't necessarily have to be correct, right? Over time, what I've realized is being structured, uh, you know, having long-term thinking is super important. At the same time, we have to be able to experiment a lot. Uh, and uh, even before you start experimenting, it's important to understand the framework using which we will be running those experiments, measuring the success or failure of the experiments, and then actually doubling down on the ones that actually work for us, right? Which is, which is typically 20% or less of those, less than that, right? So, you know, that, that's fair that things move slowly at large companies. DF is neither a startup nor a very large company. Think of DF as a 500 people company uh, that has been operational for three years and is delivering 60% of the revenue of the bank, right? Not from zero to 60, but say about 40 to 60% in, in the last 18 months. Uh, and, and just to give uh, things in, into, into the right perspective, and the DF leaders are actually going to the business line and getting all the dollars that we need to spend on talent and on whatever experiments that we have to run and on marketing to, uh, to get the results that the bank, you know, loves, right? So, uh, you know, how do I weave the two together? Uh, let's also understand as an entrepreneur, you're running fast and stuff like that, but there are lots of struggles when you're an entrepreneur. You have those lonely nights by yourself and you have no one else sitting with you, sort of sharing the problem that you have. You have those struggle of being able to raise funds. You have the struggle when you know that you can't pay, can't pay your staff the next month, right? Suddenly, all those things are taken care of for you, right? A lot of the research, and I'm not talking like research, like user feedback from tool. I'm saying the actual research with the customer. You're trying to build something that is not out there, in the, out there in the market. How do you now do the right study to understand what to build, right? Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, I would try and hustle through. Will I get the right result? I'll get a signal, but I won't potentially get the right result. 
at DFI get the support of professionals who have been doing that for years, actually sitting with me and running that for me while I can go and build the product, right? So being at DF is an amazing opportunity, mainly because you know, I don't have to worry about funding. I don't have to worry about acquiring customers. I already have tens of millions of customers. If I build the right things, I can see it spike already, right? Uh, you know, but like I said, it doesn't move as fast as you know, it, it moves in a startup, but it's both good and bad thing. You know, uh, you move fast, you fail more often, and hopefully you learn more often as well at, at a bank because we have to be super, super conservative about the privacy of my customers. Any experiment that I do, I cannot put my customer at risk. Uh, those things are there, but there are lots of pluses as well that sort of allows us to you know, do the experiments that we need to do to succeed uh, for my customers. Right. Uh and talking about experiments and innovation, uh, Gurleen here is asking about what, the, what are the machine learning and data aspects that the banking set, sector is exploring for future? How are they using the banking app to figure out the customer's data and how are they going to use it wisely? That's a great question. It's something uh, that actually uh, feeds m the messaging cluster that I own, uh, you know, a lot. So, if you have $10,000 in your bank, you know, do I go and sell you a credit limit increased product? No, it doesn't really make sense. And if you have never used your credit card ever and your balance is, your limit is $5,000, do I sell you a CLI? No, not at all. So all those things are actually sitting in the whole system. And we have a huge data analytics team that actually analyzes all the data and also gets all the interaction that my customers are doing on the touch point. And they're running models to sort of, uh, you know, provide us the right insight so that we can provide that information to my customers. Obviously, uh, you know, the number of insights that I can, you know, get ask my analytics team to, to generate, which I can feed to my clients, clients being my app, web, or ABM machine, uh, is only limited by the number of people I have and the number of models they can build and run. So, so there are opportunities of buy versus build as well where we have really, really good and talented analytics team. We have, you know, you know, you know, AI ML engineers with us uh, who, who build those models themselves and they can also work on some products and ensure that those products are giving out the right data that can then be used to sort of, uh, you know, provide the right messages to the customers. So we have a mix of both, but we are very heavy on having an in-house analytics team that is allowing us to move in the right direction so that those people can only always, you know, eat, sleep, dream analytics and allow us to provide right insights to my customers. All right. And uh, how much do regulatory, regulatory security and privacy requirements impact your ability to experiment and innovate? That's a great question. I think, I think all of these things that you just mentioned, regulatory, um, you know, privacy, security, these are, these are the most important things uh, that come up whenever we are trying to do an experimentation. So we don't think of idea and actually do experimentation. It's not the ideal way of doing it, but we know that we are not a, a bank that has no customer and we can try whatever and we'll deal with all those problems later. We cannot afford to do that. We are a very strong brand. We have tens of millions of customers. Any experiment, even a non-customer, uh, you, know, you know, we can't take that risk. So no matter what we are doing, we are trying to abstract our experimentation into different layers so that my customer data is, is sitting so far away from the front end that no one can hopefully touch it. So essentially like what I said earlier is before you do experiments, you have to figure out the framework using which we have to do experiment. Uh, and if you get the framework right, in the framework, at least in banking at, at DF, you know, one of the pillars is uh, safety, security, privacy is an important consideration and uh, all experimentations have to ensure that they will be able to, my, my experimentation will filter my customer data away from the clients so that I can still go ahead and run my experiments without compromising a data. So that's how we do it. It's not how it happens in the startup. It's a little different and there's a little bit of mindset uh, shift as well. Uh, but I think we, we figured out how to do it uh, and we're doing it you know, so far successfully. Great. And we're getting some great questions. I'm trying to just, uh, you know, combine them into themes and uh, sticking to uh, innovation and new technologies right now. Uh, Serene is asking about, is Scotia looking at blockchain to add to its portfolio? Interesting. That's an interesting question. 
So like I said, bulk of the effort that we do is more on the touch points that we have right now, but we are doing a lot of ecosystem play. We are doing, um, we, we work with, I shouldn't say work, but we partner with a lot of innovation companies that are doing a lot of innovation because we want to understand what are they doing? How does that impact uh, the lives of my customers? Does it make sense for me to buy versus build versus acquire those companies? So all those things are there. We have an innovation arm as well that works very closely with all these companies. I would say we've not said no to anything as such, uh, but I wouldn't say that that's the only thing we're doing. But we don't have our eyes closed on those opportunities. They're very much open. Uh, but like I said, Canadian banking system is a little bit conservative uh, you know, compared to the US. So we, we move a little bit slow, but none of that is off the table for us. Okay, great. Uh how do you see the future of social banking, especially post COVID and what are the challenges expected for banks? That's an interesting question. Social banking. Yeah. So, so let me just take a step back and, and talk about, although I'm a digital product lead, but to me, banking is, I think about all my customers who are banking with Scotia, right? Some of them are, bulk of them are doing banking through the app, so web, whatever that we have. Some of them are relying on the call center, contact center. Some of them are going to the branch. But I think of the most extreme scenario, you know, where, you know, far away from the metro cities, there are people living by themselves, uh, you know, an elderly couple in their late 70 or so. It's so difficult for me to actually ask them to only use digital touch points to access banking, access kosher, right? Banking to them is a social thing. They actually go to the branch because they know the branch person, they interact with them. And while they're doing all of that, the banking needs are also being taken care of, right? So, you know, post COVID, a lot of those interactions will change. I think a lot of, uh, you know, safety measures are coming in place. You've seen a huge influx of people moving away from, you know, going to the branch to, you know, actually on digital. We've seen a lot of engagement already there. And customers are loving our touch points more and more. Some of them are surprised that they were not told that such things already exist. And that's mainly because we are also conservative in you know, what we are telling our customers. We don't want to spam our customers saying, hey, we've got a new app. You can do everything on the app. That's not something that we're doing. But we've seen a huge influx of a lot of my customers move away from you know, the physical touch points or the, or the phone touch point to actually the app or web. Um, However, the branches will continue to exist. There will be challenges, uh, but uh, you know, we'll have to figure out ways of doing that. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep those channels available to our customers uh, and make sure that we're taking enough precautions to keep everyone protected. Great. And uh, talking about innovation, like we t we're talking a lot about you know, B2C, consumer-focused products. Uh, what sort of innovation is ha happening on the B2B, the, on, uh, the enterprise side of, bank, of the banking industry? Sure. So I'll try and talk about a few of those. So, so Scotia is very heavy in the auto sector. Uh, and, uh, you know, many people are our customers without knowing that they are our customers because they're taking that, you know, the auto mortgage, auto loan from a dealer. Uh, but I'm not saying that, uh, so, so we have a lot of customers through that, but the point I'm trying to make is we have deep relationship with a lot of, you know, dealers and, you know, manufacturers and stuff like that. So a part of DF is also committed is, is actually spending a lot of time and has built few products in that space where we are working very closely with manufacturers and dealers in coming up with new offering, uh, you know, for their customers and our customers. Um, we have a lot of work going on in payment modernization and in digital identity space where it's not a B2C play right now. It's more trying to come up, create the ecosystem where we are sort of working with, at least in the identity, we are working with a lot of banks. We are working with a lot of e-commerce companies like the tech technology companies with, with the government and stuff. This is because when we are building this identity, it is going to be useful for all these large companies and not just you know, a few, few of us, few, few of the banks. So we have a lot of things going on there as well. There are a lot of things, um, at least in the B2B space, that have huge opportunity for Scotia to acquire customers and engage them better. There is some effort going on over there as well, uh, but I would say more focus is on the payment modernization, on the identity and on the auto sector uh, than, than that. All right. And 
talking about partners uh rick here is asking at at df do you exclusively exclusively build your own products or do you also work with partners or with startups who are building products that can address problems that scotia wishes to solve that's an interesting question and i think so just to give some context uh the product team at scotia bank df right now is about you know 36 or maybe a little bit more maybe a close to 40 right so we have a fairly large product team i think it's a decision that was made early on to actually build everything whatever we were trying to build at that point in time in house and that decision has sort of paid off so far so we've done really well at least with with the teams that we have built so far although we are definitely coming to a to a point where we you know we continue to get a lot of talent but not as much as the bank would like right having said that uh, i think the there's no decision taken as such we'll continue to build a lot of the products in house but we are open to you know using products from outside as well there are lots of initiatives going on where we are evaluating vendors um i wouldn't say we sort of uh, we don't discourage any company as such but we can only partner with a company of a certain size and above because we want to make sure that a lot of things are taken care of for my customers if i end up using a certain product uh and, and like you earlier said safety privacy all those things are top concerns for us we can only work with companies that will meet the standards that we need to have um before we can sort of work with them it doesn't and obviously companies that have existed for a while that have no problem existing for the you know, next 3 to 5 years is other kind of companies we can work with it'll be very difficult for us to sort of work with a company that has run rate for the next 6 months only um ha- having said that we have an innovation team with us that sort of works very closely or keeps an eye on all these kind of companies more to understand the kind of products that are there and the kind of sparks that those products are uh you know generating the market to sort of fuel ideas into us uh of both buy versus build all right and uh this this these next two questions are more on, on the on the side of the customer earlier you mentioned that you know you try to understand the customer a lot so what artifacts do you find the most useful for communicating with your team uh, with, with your team sorry so is it like user stories is it the customer journey is it jobs to be done or or what it, sure 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 i think before we talk about jobs to be done or stories i think they, they are definitely important before execution can happen but being able to really articulate the story or being able to articulate the need of the customer or the state of the customer is super super important before really telling the team the, the tech team on what to build and stuff definitely we have to tell them give them the stories or whatever tasks to do and stuff not really tasks to do it's more in the form of stories but it's more around the value so so one of the things that i do is actually i hold a weekly meeting with my entire team where i'm sort of giving them as much context as possible where i'm trying to bring all those scenarios or journeys you know uh, whatever is relevant in front of them because you know the good thing is it's a b2c thing and all of us can think like a customer it's not super difficult um and so uh you know just trying to bring them the context of you know why are we trying to do this or what is the problem that we are trying to solve or what is the opportunity that i see in front and uh i start from there and then suddenly the whole team sort of understands they share their feedback as well that sort of helps us come up with a better solution uh and uh once the team you know sort of buys the solution in a way if you will uh you know the execution is much better the kind of scenarios that they are able to cover is much better and you have a better product so that's where i start it's never it never starts from tasks to do or stories we have to give them stories but it starts from you know what what and why and the value and the impact mm-hmm. all right and another question on the customer side uh, given that uh, digital factory belongs to a large and mature organization which already enjoys a huge market share how does df isolate and prove value being added for customers as and business goals through its experiments okay how does uh, df okay so i think we have a lot of tools already available using which we are able to show i mean the tactical answer is that we have all those tools av- available using which we can demonstrate the the deliveries the impressions the ctrs you know the, the number of offers the number of products that are bought through the digital touch points which we own which df owns right so that's that's a very simple answer and that speaks for itself but overall the speed at which 
DF has been able to deliver products. Uh, and I'm speaking more for the last 12 to 18 months and not so much for the first two years. Uh, we've definitely changed gears uh, from the first two years to the, to the last 18 months. The business clients can see huge, huge difference. Uh, you know, you know, in the COVID times, the kind of traffic we've seen on our app and web has been crazy. And the way everything has, you know, stayed, the kind of performance that we've had, you know, the time it takes for my app to load when you actually sign in, uh, everything is amazing. Our customers see it, our business lines see it because they are customers too. Sometimes they raise some stuff to the DF and the amount of time, time it takes for us to resolve it is, is, is super awesome. So it hasn't really taken a lot of effort from our side to sort of, right now when we have all those things in the market for us to demonstrate the value that we add uh, as DF. But I think early on, my leaders have done an amazing job. They continue to do that in terms of, you know, managing the expectation of uh, the business lines in getting the necessary funding from the business lines and also shielding us away from, you know, the, the, the whole stakeholder management thing that you mentioned uh, so that we can do our job really well. All right. And, uh... Another question uh, by Lee. He's asking. You mentioned earlier that uh, mess that uh, earlier that your messaging cluster works cross functionally with other product and go to market teams. So how do you manage alignment to deliver a better solution? That, that's a great question, actually. So right when I started uh, started on this team, uh, one of the biggest client and actually the only client I had was the mobile app client, right? So everything and anything that I was building was essentially for them. In a way, it was marriage of, you know, my cluster and the mobile app, right? And that's where we had to sort of stay, you know, take a step back and sort of, uh, uh, you know, be agnostic of who we were serving, but actually build capability in a way that we could solve for other channels at, as well, if those channels were ready. So we made those transition, we made those changes on our tech stack in a way that, uh, you know, we were ready to serve other channels if they were ready. And then we sort of went ahead and showed the success that we were having with the mobile app to other teams. And then uh, when the other team saw the kind of success we were able to show on mobile, it was not very difficult for them to say, sure, we would like to be onboarded as well. What does it take? And we had built our tech in a way where we could just get integrated with new channels without doing a release. And that sort of really, you know, worked in our favor. We were able to get, you know, we were able to integrate fairly quickly and start delivering messages on the new channel and, uh, you know, show them success from, you know, day one. So it's, it's, it's being able to take a step back and, and think about things strategically uh, and, and, and then build the product portfolio in a way that we could scale it is what has worked for us. Okay. Um, and uh, another question here from Kwan, he's, he's making a comment first saying some traditional banks are building a challenger bank by themselves. Uh, some lean towards uh, offering banking infra as a utility, utility service to social media and e-commerce players whose user base is gig uh, gigantic. Uh, some lead towards sticking to the bank's brand value and promise to clients built over decades. Is Digital Factory or Scotia in general doing something similar, which is leaning towards any particular direction? That's a, that's a great question. And uh, there are lots of uh, you know, insights in that question itself. Um, you know, a lot of things, what challenger banks are doing, what traditional banks are doing. I would say that you know, Scotia, to me, yes, I work there. It's a bank, but actually it's, it's a very, very strong brand. It has taken like 100 plus years to, to be where we are, right? Uh, it's not just a brand that I think I cherish. It, it's a brand that people relate with, right? Many people have been banking with Scotia for, you know, 35, 40 years, maybe longer, right? So I would never, uh, so I, I think having said that, we will, we will continue to build a stronger brand than what we have. Uh, we will never, you know, try and deviate from that. I think we have a great brand. We'll, we'll continue building it stronger and stronger. Talking about what the challenge banks are doing, we have Thunder in with us, right? So those kind of banks offer a different kind of value to the customers. We've seen the success that, you know, a challenger bank offers. Uh, between us, us as in Scotia and Tangerine, we are able to offer, you know, sort of cater to different kind of markets as well. And we offer the entire product suite that a customer is looking for from a bank. So, you know, just to answer your question, uh, you know, I know a lot of technology company that have huge giant customer base are also entering the banking sector and they, they might be offering a checking account or a saving account and they'll continue to do that. And that's where 
I think I mentioned earlier is if I look out for any, any of those companies, it is those large tech companies that are sort of moving into banking and have to make sure that our experience is, is, is comparable, if not superior to those products. Uh, so that, you know, we will never lose any of our customers because we don't just offer run checking or saving. We offer everything that a customer needs. They are 21. We offer them products. They're an overseas immigrant to immigrant student. We offer them products and we'll offer them all the way till they're in their late eighties or whatever. Right. So, so we are very confident and uh, we don't really have to change directions. We'll stay very firm where we stand today. All right. And uh, so Harman is asking another question. He's asking that a few other entrepreneurial uh, minded professionals who have come uh, to product AMA sessions have also mentioned that the Canadian startup ecosystem is a bit slower when compared with the startup ecosystem south of the border. What specific factors do you think really impedes speed of execution in our ecosystem? Do you think we need to work on it to make it faster? If yes, how? That's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. It's not just south of the border, it's a few other places also. So I used to be in India in a city called Pune and things only moved at a certain pace. The moment I went to Bangalore or Mumbai, things were moving very differently. And I see the same happening here uh, in Canada as well. In fact, it's not just south of the border, you know, how are things moving in Calgary? How, how are things moving in Nova Scotia? And you know, how are things moving in you know, Niagara Falls compared to Toronto downtown, right? Things sort of change, but I think what I've seen is uh, where places where there are lots of early adopters, uh, suddenly the ecosystem starts forming. And I've seen that across different areas as well. So, um, so yeah, so I sort of agree, but then I'm also thinking about a company called Ritual. Everyone knows Ritual, right? And it's, it's being able to really address a core problem and build an experience that solves the core problem in a way. And the experience has to be so, so good that you know, customers once on border through that experience, so sort of stay on that experience forever, right? It's about, uh, it's about building, solving a real problem and, and getting the PMF right and sort of building that unique, uh, you know, experience is what is going to onboard more and more customers to such product. And as and when more and more companies start doing it, it sort of creates the ecosystem where, you know, you and I are on LinkedIn, the next day we are on lunch club, I'm, I'm exploring lunch club these days. And, you know, sort of we are on ritual, we are on well simple, we, we start trying the same set of customers are trying the same, the new new products sort of gives a lot of belief to the to the entrepreneur, to the investors, and that's how the ecosystem sort of creates. So I know what you're saying, I sort of agree with you. But the only good thing is, I think we've come a far, you know, to a much better place now compared to where we were maybe three to five years back. And I feel that Toronto with, you know, uh, Canada in general being such a warm country is attracting a lot of talent, overseas talent, also overseas investors. Uh, things are only getting better from us. Uh, and I think a lot of companies already, these startup companies that are doing the right things are creating the ecosystem of customers, investors, entrepreneurs, and people are sharing much more. People are way more open. And all of that is helping us to move faster uh, towards where the south of border exists right now. Awesome. So we have about, I think, four or five minutes left. Uh, and I think we have time for one or two more questions. So I'm going to ask you the first one, which is Babi Sheikh. He's asking what differently you're doing at Digital Factory to attract specific customer segment, uh, which, is, which are the millennials uh, who are moving away from traditional banking. That's a great question. <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. And I think I did touch upon this question earlier where, you know, when DF started, we were trying to build the next shiny thing, right? Essentially chasing those customers that were trying to move away from traditional banking, right? But essentially, if you think about it, what is traditional banking, right? And what is that? What is a non-traditional banking, right? So even in a challenge bank, what are you doing essentially? You're just using a digital touch point to access everything. It is a self-serve touch point for you. And uh, that's exactly what we build at DF as well, right? So if you choose to use my app or web or whatever, or call my contact center or go to the branch, you can do everything that you need to do on either of those touch points, right? That sort of positions me uh, in the league of challenger banks in a way, but talking about what am I doing to acquire those millennials? We have a huge digital marketing team, uh, you know, that are chasing different customer segments and we are helping them, you know, 
we, we work very closely with them because when we onboard all these customers onto my app, you know, we have to make sure that we are giving them the right information so that the experience that they get on my app compared to a challenger app, they should not be able to, you know, they, they should see, you know, if not same, if not better, at least the same information. In fact, we offer way more products than any challenger bank offers today. Right. So we have that, 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 uh, you know, position is already, we already have that strength with us, with us. We're trying to use that to offer right information, right stuff to my customers to onboard them better, to give them better products at a much better price and, you know, engage with them hopefully for, for their life. Right. That's, that's what we're doing. Uh, Challenger bank, you know, if I start a new challenger bank, I have no customers. I'm going to try, you know, whatever so that I can acquire those customers. I'll, I'll, say whatever, but I know that once I have, you know, good number of customers in order to engage those customers for a long duration, I'll have to offer new product portfolio, which is a very complicated thing. Uh, and, and so we know that really well, which is why we are not really scared of all these, uh, all these challenger banks. Well, I think uh, we're almost at time. So thank you so much Mukesh for taking the time out to come uh, on product KMA. It's been a great one hour of learning about what's happening in bank in the banking industry. And uh, thank you so much again, Mukesh, for joining us. It's been a pleasure hosting you. And we really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, everyone, take care, stay safe, enjoy the rest of your day. And don't forget to tune in tomorrow and day after. Follow Product MA on Twitter and send us your topic suggestions. We look forward to seeing you soon.